Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guests, His Excellency Mr. Tariq Luja, a board member of the Muhammad Rashi School of Government, and all the other distinguished guests we have. And it's with great pleasure that we kick off a year of exciting activities planned ahead of us. And I am very pleased to welcome you to the launch of our Distinguished Speakers series. It couldn't be more befitting but to have Mr. Peter Allen here with us today to kickstart this series of public speeches that we are, you know, hoping to introduce and to share with the with our community, with our students, with our stakeholders. I will take a brief moment to introduce Mr. Peter Allen, who will then take us through a very interesting and promising topic as well. We enjoyed Mr. Peter Allen's presentation to us this morning, and uh, we're very happy to uh, be able to uh, have yet another good session. Mr. Peter Allen is the Deputy Dean of the Australia and New Zealand School of Government. He joined ANZO in 2009, after more than 20 years in the Victorian Public Service, most recently as Under Secretary in the Department of Human Services. His earlier responsibilities included Secretary of the Victorian Department of Education and the Department of Tourism, Sport and the Commonwealth Games, and Senior Positions in Community Services in Victoria and health and community services. Before joining the Victorian Public Service, Mr. Allen's career included journalism, the private sector, the Australian Public Service, and the welfare sector. Mr. Allen is a National Fellow of the Institute of Public Administration of Australia and a Fellow of the Victorian Institute of Public Administration. He also chairs the Management Committee of the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency. As I was saying this morning, Mr. Allen has left no possible post in any government, but he has had a try. He's tried his hand at that thing in all, all different sectors. The title of his presentation today is Rethinking Public Service Delivery. And in the same spirit, Mr. Allen is going to also rethink public lecture delivery, so we won't be having any PowerPoints today. We will be speaking directly, and we hope to enjoy the interaction that will follow with Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and can I add my um, welcome to our distinguished guests and all of you here today, um, and particularly um, thank you for your interest in a topic I hope is one that we share. Um, my ANSOG colleague, um, Professor Gary Sturgis, recently reminded me that um, from 1833 until 1858, India was governed by a joint stock corporation, the East India Company, under legislative mandate from the British Parliament. In an earlier paper, Professor Sturgis, who's the New South Wales ANSOG Chair of Public Service Delivery, also reminded us that the British fleet that brought the first English settlers to Australia was privately owned and under contract to the British government. I relate these examples to highlight that there is a long history of governments engaging with providers outside government, including the private sector, to deliver what we might now recognise as core government responsibilities. For ANSOL, um, which was established by all the governments of Australia and New Zealand and 16 universities in 2002, um, established to deliver world-class teaching and research to our emerging public service leaders. The public service economy and rethinking public service delivery have been priority issues for our research and teaching over the past decade. And in a sense, what I'd like to do tonight is take you through what some of that research is showing us or suggesting that we should focus on in the future. Um, much of this research has been led by Professor John Alford, who's ANSOG's Professor of Public Sector Management. Um, Professor Alford has researched, published, and taught extensively about how public value 
can be created by cooperation between governments and their public officials, with other agencies, private contractors, not-for-profit providers, volunteers, citizens and various other stakeholders. In his 2009 book, Engaging Public, Cli public Sector Clients from Service Delivery to Co-Production, Professor Alford uses case studies from three different countries to explore when, where and how government organisations need their clients to contribute time and effort to co-producing public services and how organisations can better obtain this work from citizens by providing good client service and appealing to their citizens' intrinsic needs and social values. The key insight that public sector organisations need clients to contribute, clients or citizens, to contribute time, effort, information and compliance to deliver the desired value has an equally important contradistinction that governments may find it difficult to deliver services without clients contributing to the co-production of these services. Health services, which take up a significant proportion of most governments' budgets, provide a robust case study. Here, Professor Alford observes that even in the most conventional health activity, the treatment of sick or injured patients, the professionals delivering the services, such as doctors or nurses, do not by themselves cure or even alleviate the conditions of those patients who are conscious and functioning. They rely on patients to behave in certain ways, such as resting or ingesting the prescribed medications. Alongside the treatment of those who are already sick is the increasing emphasis on health programs that aim to present, prevent disease. And as Professor Alford notes, these typically call for even more work on the part of those who they cater for in undertaking regular exercise, eating healthy diets and pursuing balanced lifestyles. The desired outcomes, such as fewer people incurring cancer or heart disease, cannot be achieved unless clients do this work. So reflecting this priority focus of ANSOC, not only helping governments through teaching and research to address their core responsibilities, in this case, addressing citizens' needs, Professor Orford's research and insights now underpin several streams, streams of ANSOC's teaching activities. His more recent research, published co-jointly with his with Professor Gino, Janino Flynn, focuses on the challenges for public management pain posed by the new ways governments are now designing and delivering services to clients. These include contracting, partnering, client co-production, intergovernment collaboration, and volunteering. Emergency services, such as the fire service, provide a good illustration. While the fire service in Australia, at least, is unambig unambiguously public in nature, it is simply impossible to run a fire service without the contribution of a whole variety of other entities. Some of these are other government services, such as the police or ambulances, with whom they have to coordinate interventions, such as clearing traffic when um, they're moving to a fire. And more broadly, the public have important roles, reporting fires, for instance, and when driving, giving way to emergency vehicles. Also in Australia, there is a direct responsibility on citizens to install fire alarms within their houses. The fire service also depends on engagement of the owners and occupants of buildings where fires or other emergencies might occur. For example, the owners of buildings in Australia have to comply with fire codes in their construction <coughs> and their maintenance. <coughs> occupants need to be aware of fire safety in their offices and surrounds. And in these and many other ways, um, the purpose of the fire service is, was, is fulfilled not only by its employees, but also by a myriad of other actors. In fact, um, my argument would be that almost every government organisation depends on other parties to help implement their policies and to deliver services. Very rarely does a public sector agency have sole, sole control over the whole process of producing the public service for which it is responsible. Invariably, it has to call on effort, information or compliance from other parties. The analysis and conclusions from this research now informs several ANSOL programs and is helping public officials in Australia and New Zealand 
understand the broader set of mechanisms that might be deployed by government to introduce, to induce external parties to contribute. The research and teaching also helps public officials appreciate the range of motivations that might explain why external parties assist with the achievement of public purposes. Not just the desire for material rewards, rewards or to avoid sanctions, but also non-material motivations such as intrinsic rewards, peer pressure or approval. In the introduction of the publication resulting from their research, um, Professors O'Flynn and Alford also highlight that their research and analysis support a contingent approach to designing public service delivery. In other words, the decision to externalise a service depends on the specific circumstances, circumstances which vary from one situation to another. Looking back to the era when the services were delivered by government's own employees, and when or many of the services were delivered by government's own employees, and when the goal of reform-focused managers was to make them work more efficiently, to the more recent era where, the, where better and cheaper government was to come from handing public services over to the private sector by contracts. But Flynn and Orford argue that expectations and opportunities have changed again. They suggest more integrated and responsive public services will come from greater collaboration between government agencies, private firms, and non-profit community-based agencies. Reflecting Anson's core purpose, the research and subsequent book aim to offer public service managers a guide to how to think about and manage the relationships that underpin efficient and effective service delivery by governments to the community. On the other stream of ANSOC research um, and teaching um, that supports the changing nature of public service delivery is led by um, Professor Gary Sturgis, the New South Wales Premier's Chair of Service Delivery. In a paper prepared to the New South, for the New South Wales Business Chamber, um, Professor Sturgis has proposed that government should shift its thinking and embrace the public service economy. He argues that this should include greater innovation and contestability in the design and management of public services and possibly trade in public services across state and national borders. The export of Australia's higher education services is one example he offers of the ability of any nation's public service to export successfully into a contestable market. Professor Sturgis also emphasises that this is not an argument of privatising public services, nor is it concerned with simple outsourcing. Rather, he argues, the success of contestability lies in the quality of the contract a challenging question arising from this analysis for me, at least in, for Australia, is what should remain in the direct control of the public sector? Arguably, Australians, possibly in common with citizens of the Gulf states, would want, from, would want frontline defence and policing, the court system, and key regulatory roles to remain free from competition and directly delivered by government. And should the rest be open to competition, or at least the threat of competition? Professor Sturgis argues that in a complex modern society, government will need to commission the vast majority of public services, ensuring that fundamental issues of access and equity are addressed and making certain that they are integrated for the convenience of service users. An important clarification for this discussion is the distinction between purchasing, procurement, and commissioning. An American academic, Gordon Murray, um, in a paper exploring these differences, argues that commissioning is very different from procurement and that recognising and accepting the differences will improve both commissioning and or purchasing and procurement success. As one element of the differentiation, he argues that procurement encompasses the make or buy decision, whereas purchasing does not. Arriving at answers to questions such as, is a new prison? or a crime production strategy, the best response to a rising crime rate, um, the answer to that question should precede any decision about the nature of the service response and who is best to deliver it. If a decision is made to commission delivery of government-funded services, the UK government's 
principles of good commissioning outline the issues that need to be addressed. Firstly, the importance of understanding the needs of users and other communities by ensuring commissioners, those who are doing the commissioning, engage with third, third sector organisations to access specialist knowledge. Secondly, the importance of consulting potential provider organisations well in advance of commissioning new services, working with them to set priority outcomes for that service. Thirdly, to recognise that outcomes for service, for service users are at the heart of the strategic planning process. So the focus on outcome need to be kept front and centre of decision making. Fourthly, to map the fullest possible range of providers with a view to understanding the contribution each could make to delivery of better outcomes. To also consider investing in the capacity of the provider base, particularly those working with hard to reach groups. And ensure contracting processes are transparent and fair, facilitating the involvement of the broadest range of suppliers, including considering subcontracting and consortia building where that seems appropriate. Then to seek to ensure long-term contracts and risk sharing wherever appropriate, as much as anything to achieve efficiency and effectiveness. And finally, and probably most importantly from our point of view, to seek feedback from service users, communities and providers in order to review the effectiveness of the commissioning process in meeting the local needs. A central argument for the future development of the public service economy is certainly for greater diversity of service models. That said, Australia already has a mixed economy in most public services. For example, around 40% of hospital patients are treated in a private hospital. One third of school children attend a private school. Private and not-for-profit providers account for 90% of residential aged care. And close to 20% of prisoners are housed in a facility owned or managed by a private contractor. In Victoria, the state of Australia where I live, the proportion is more like a third. In advocating for more competition and contestability on the supply side of the public sector economy, Professor Sturgis outlines three models. The first is choice-based models, which involve service users selecting from a range of alternative providers financed through government vouchers. Examples of this include choice-based lettings of public housing and personalised budgets for disability care. While Australia has employed these sorts of models for many years, there is a growing interest in their wider application with the proposed National Disability Insurance Scheme, one of the most interesting initiatives now being rolled out. Secondly, commissioning models where, we should look at commissioning models where public officials purchase services on behalf of the community through competitive tendering and contracting. While this option should include simple outsourcing model, it should also embrace public-private partnerships, public-private joint ventures, and integration contracts. A final option is contestability, um, where service provided at benchmark and institutions face actual competition, or at least the credible threat of competition. While this model has only been used by some Australian, only been used to a limited extent by some Australian state governments, it has been. It has not been systematically implemented in Australia, and for example, intervention frameworks and benchmarking have not yet been developed. But around the world, governments are asking what does an efficient and effective public sector look like? One that works constructively with citizens to address their needs, particularly in the tighter and tougher economic conditions facing many governments, including Australia. One response will be governments rethinking public service delivery and recognising how public value can be created by government working more closely with citizens to maximise opportunities for co-production alongside increasing cooperation with other public sector agencies, private contractors, not-for-profits, volunteers and other stakeholders. And through all of this, government will need to be attentive to the costs and the risks of greater collaboration. Professor Alford's research and teaching focuses directly on the challenges for public servants in considering first the what should we contract question 
and whether we should contract before moving onto the how we should do it. This work has helped public officials in Australia more methodically address four issues in assessing whether and how to use service providers external to government. Firstly, to determine who are the external providers, where, where the challenge is to think of a much wider range of possible providers than private contractors, not-for-profit organisations and possibly volunteers. The second challenge is to address the question specifically about when we should externalise, the when, where options range from almost always to hardly ever, to the pragmatists when it represents best value for money. Professor Walford's research leads me for one to conclude that it all depends on the answer to whether the benefits outweigh the costs, and that will vary with the circumstances in any particular situation. Um, the third important question is, how do we get external providers to best contribute? Do we use carrots, such as financial incentives, or sticks, sticks such as sanctions? And arguably the most inter interesting question for us at Ansel is how do we equip government officials and their organisations with the capacities required to deal <coughs> effectively and constructively with external providers. The answer is almost always a mix of sector and organisation change combined with developing staff competencies within government agencies. Professor Walford's work, work encourages us to think more broadly about who we would identify as the external providers. If we're thinking about garbage collection, for example, we would almost always think about mainstream business. Although recent experience in the United Kingdom might encourage us to think of a public service mutual as an option. On the other hand, if we're thinking about community-based healthcare, we would probably think about a combination of not-for-profit or voluntary community organisations. And for employment programs, um, Professor Orford's research has highlighted the importance and value of unemployed the unemployed individual making a co-production contribution. Or in other words, the job search is much easier to be much more likely to be successful if the individual actually wants a job. And the social protection services such as child protection, an effective response depends on connected inputs from teachers, doctors, neighbours and family members. Um, when we turn to the cost-benefit trade-offs in any decision-making processes to externalise service provision. We best weigh up three types of benefits and costs. Service or value for money, relationships or making it happen, and strategic, where or what are the costs and benefits of sustaining the initiative over time. If we are seriously interested in externalising service provision, the research ANSOG has developed highlights that we also need to weigh up the obstacles that government itself creates. These are the accountability rules, including finance and procurement, for example, the complexity or interdependency, or to put it more explicitly, who takes the credit for success and who accepts the blame for failure, um, the time it takes and the likelihood that some of the key drivers and supports and constraints will change decisively as a consequence of unexpected change, and finally, the cultural differences that often exist between players who are brought together for the first time to deliver services in new and challenging ways. When we look at the service delivery challenges over the next 10 to 20 years, Professor Peter Shurkoff, former chair of both the ANSOL board and Australia's Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, has identified four drivers of change. First, public sector will no longer be the sole provider of policies, programs or services. And informed by the work of Professor Sturgis and Alford, Australian public services are increasingly commissioning and contracting out service delivery to the private and community sectors. And we are seeing the development of what Professor Sturgis describes as the public sector economy, where the mix of public, private and third sector providers supply services to government and directly to the public. The argument is that greater competition on the supply side of the public sector economy can be achieved through choice-based models where service users select from a range of alternatives through government vouchers, commissioning models 
where services are purchased through competitive tendering and contracting and increasing visibility through benchmarking. Um, the second issue will be the increased competition in the delivery of public policy. The public service no longer has a monopoly of providing policy advice to government, with growth in contestability of policy provides provided by other advisors such as ministerial staff, think tanks, lobby groups, the media, and research institutes. The UK, for example, has taken this one step further with the creation of essentially resourced policy contestability fund for ministers who are able to seek policy advice from beyond Whitehall or beyond the public service. In Australia, we've also seen a rapid growth of government engaging top tier consulting firms for strategic advice. Um, the business model for the Australian New Zealand School of Government, for example, was developed by the Boston Consulting Group. The third issue is the co-production of government services that will enable citizens to design and deliver activities with government to meet their need and deliver better results. Success requires a reciprocal relationship between public servants and people using services. And here an illustrative example would be greater patient involvement in planning their health treatment. And finally, um, the reinvigoration of democratic engagement with digital media, for example, providing opportunities for increased engagement, reshaping how communities find and engage each other on political and social issues. Uh, Professor Shergold acknowledges that this creates challenges for government and the public service, requiring them to assess their structures, speed, work practices, and the way they engage with citizens. And to support this um, new area of work, ANSOG is um, engaged in a research project at present um, that um, beyond social media, government as a social machine. Um, and what social machine is defined as, which is one of those many definitions that leave as many questions as they answer, is the socio-technical -te system of computers and the many human beings engaged with them. And what the research is looking at is what 21st century government will look like as a social machine in its own right, through the medium, using the medium of technology to move beyond the idea of what might be called vending machine government, where we pay our taxes and expect services in return. Social machines um, tap into a new kind of engagement um, and an emergent collective problem solving, where problems are beginning to be solved by very large human scale, large scale human participation via the web, where there is access to or the ability to generate large amount of relevant data using open data standards, um, where there is increasing confidence in the quality of the data, and where the human computer interfaces are becoming more intuitive and seamless. The essential perspective with this work on social machines is it is not just social media. The whole idea is to, is to utilize complementary relationships between human input and machine computation in order to actually do something. Social media is largely a marketing and listening tool, but the social machine becomes something much more powerful. So what this research is looking at is how does government acting or viewing itself as a social machine change the way it interacts with citizens? The second question is what are the key challenges flowing from this new perspective? And finally, how should government best address these challenges? All of this comes together, I think, in the reality um, that none of the various ways of reform have eliminated what came before. Rather, each has overlaid its pre predecessor so that today's public managers deal with a whole variety of external providers um, through an array of relationships. An equally important conclusion of much of this work is that there is no one best way of designing and delivering government services to the community. Instead, the new world of public service delivery 
at least in Australia and New Zealand, is one where there are different ways for different circumstances. This new finding of new paths calls for broader perspective, going beyond solutions such as contracts, collaboration and co-production on their own. And Professor Alton and O'Flynn suggest that we need first to question the way we think about purposes. One of the characteristics of traditional public administration was that ends tended to be defined as whatever the organisation was already doing. Means and ends amount to the same thing. Not surprisingly, this meant that alternative to in-house production were rarely considered. New public management in its various forms shifted the emphasis to results. However, results tended to be fairly narrowly defined as outputs. Um, the shortcomings of this approach became more salient as governments increasingly contracted out more com complex tasks, took on complex, multifaceted problems, engaged more and more parties to share in tackling them, and engaged with citizens in deliberation about them. And so professors Orford and O'Flynn argue that one consequence was limiting the scope of imagining beyond ways of imagining new ways of achieving outcomes. They suggest that public sector managers should now focus more expansively on ultimate purposes and the means of achieving them. And to quote them, the key concern is to optimise what is of value to the public. Unquote. Second, uh, they do encourage us to think more broadly about the range of actors who might contribute to the achievement of desired public purposes, from government organisations and their contract providers to a range of others that I've talked about earlier in this paper. Thirdly, they highlight that the decision to externalise service delivery outside government involves taking account not only of the service benefits and costs, but also those of managing the relationships and those affecting the strategic situation of the government organisation and the value it provides. The argument is that decisions about whether services should be delivered by the public or the private sector should depend on the context and the nature of the service. Fourthly, the decision needs to take account of the wider range of factors in inducing external parties to contribute to public service delivery. And finally, um, the research highlights that the new ways of delivering services calls for a broader conception of the work of public servants. Not only do they deliver services themselves, but they also engage in activity designed to induce others to contribute to the delivery, such as implying sanctions and incentives, re-engineering service delivery tasks to make them convenient to external parties, mobilising peer groups or representing purposes that attract support. And this is almost always more challenging work, but has the potential to be more absorbing and interesting and rewarding for public officials. Within this evolving world of, world of public service delivery, four themes appear likely to underpin the roles of public servants in the decades ahead. Firstly, collaboration, with the key challenge of understanding how to connect people and organise to, organisations to maximise public value. Secondly, communication with an emphasis on digital media modes and an understanding that the opportunities associated with um, government as a social machine will become increasingly interesting and increasingly important. Thirdly, commercialisation or getting the best value from public, private and community sectors. And finally, ensuring legal, financial and democratic requirements and community expectations are met. These roles will need to be supported by a diverse skill set. Researchers at the University of Phoenix, um, for example, have identified the enabling skills of the future public sector workforce. These include adaptive thinking to enable the generation of solutions outside the norm and to respond to unexpected and unique situations. They also include cross-cultural competency to facilitate effective work in unfamiliar cultural settings and to identify the opportunities to use differences to innovate. They include the ability to make sense and get to the deeper meaning of what is being communicated. And social intelligence and the ability to relate to others directly and deeply. It's also going to require 
skills in computational thinking and the ability to translate large amounts of data into useful concepts to, and to develop data-based reasoning. The ability to leverage new media forms to communicate persuasively and the research government as a social machine will be an important um, source of some additional perspective in that regard. We'll need to understand, we as public servants, we'll need to understand concepts across different disciplines to solve complex problems. And we will need a design mindset, or the ability to design tasks, processes, and work environments to produce desired outcomes. We'll also need to be able to filter important information from the noise and use new tools to expand mental functioning abilities. And finally, we'll need the ability to work productively with others across virtual distances. Working alongside public sector agencies um, and SOC where I work, we'll continue to research deeply and develop teaching programs that equip public sector leaders with the knowledge and perspective to enhance these capabilities. And in closing, I suggest that ANSOL um, and our shared interests um, and our shared purposes should encourage development of working relationships between the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government and ANSOL. And I look forward to supporting this endeavour as best I can. The challenge ANSOC shares with all schools of government um, is to ensure our research and teaching equips our future public and sector leaders with the knowledge and skills to both manage the changing roles and responsibilities while maintaining a sharp focus on ensuring the best possible value is delivered to our citizens. I trust our shared interests and shared challenges will encourage us to develop a closing working relationship in the future and look forward to being in part of and supporting that further work. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate the very enlightening uh, and very informative uh, lecture, obviously. I must say, uh, one of the famous quotes, I think, by Albert Einstein goes like this. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. So we, we of course, laid quite a few interesting thoughts and ideas here. But from your experience as a practitioner, if I may just start by asking you a couple of very good questions. And based on this experience in your practice, I'm sure this public, I mean, clearly what, what we are talking about from the beginning of the is, is that the service that delivery is shifting from the old traditional one supplier for all services whereby you want to come to the mixed, so-called mixed economy where the public and the private sector <coughs> are working together on delivering services with certain criteria, certain you know, uh, quality and so on. Now I'm sure there has been examples already, you mentioned a few of them in the course of your presentation. But I'd like you to give us, if possible, a good, bad, and ugly examples of, of how these public-private partnerships, and if you can be quick and just give us Examples of these have turned out at that level. So I'll give you um, two examples, um, sort of quite different in in many ways, but and uh, both both are perspectives of mine. So in Australia, um, we had uh, we had a long tradition of government providing schooling to all citizens. Over the past 50 years, there's been increasing growth of private schools, um, private, private provision of education within the framework established by government. Um, when I was um, head of the education department in Victoria, I accepted that with secondary school, people would um, increasingly move to private providers. But in the interest of building social solidarity, it was important to try and maintain a dominant role for the public sector in the provision of primary school education, partly because it meant that children would go to a school close to where they live and it would help develop neighbourly connections, and that at least for the first six years of schooling, all citizens would enjoy a broadly similar experience and they would then after that they would then go into different streams. 
And I wasn't particularly successful in that, and I think um, the, the, private, the private sector in education is um, growing in the state of Victoria more and more, a more and more significant provider, and it is now very much involved in delivering private education, uh, private education to young children. Um, one of the consequences is we increase traffic congestion because parents are driving children to school or buses are crisscrossing the south. But the more important downside for me is that the, the strength of social cohesion is diminished. Um, the second example is our public hospitals, where I think as I noted that um, about a third and an increasing proportion in, in the future of um, hospital treatment will be delivered by the private sector. Um, one of the downsides of that is that um, we have to build a separate, we have to rebuild a medical research capability because one of the things that our public hospitals did historically was cross-subsidise medical research. Um, when we run a private hospital, um, they will only do research that's funded by someone. And it's much more difficult to cross-subsidise. And as we, as we um, increasingly fragment the acute service provision in the health services sector, um, some of the volume that's associated with seeing patterns um, becomes a bit more difficult and we will rely more on sharing data than doctors actually seeing or seeing a pattern in what they are actually treating. But as a nation we have to rethink how we, how we fund um, acute, acute health research um, because it's becoming much less um, possible to do it, well, it's not possible without additional funding into the private sector, and as budget pressures bear down, compared to budget pressures bear down on the public hospital system, it's getting harder and harder to do that. So, there are, the important lesson for me is that we need to think through the implications, um, make sure we're comfortable with those implications, and then work out what the response to that is. It's not that they we can turn the clock back or change what is being driven by powerful other forces, uh, but it's recognising what the community needs to ensure the best possible service delivery in poor areas like education of children and health. Thank you. I, what you were telling us was I was thinking of Dubai, you know, we've got a very strong influence on private education in Dubai now and healthcare. You were just saying something which is very familiar to us here, yeah, I think. We, we know exactly what you were referring to, and, uh, but uh, with one difference, I think our public uh, hospitals here never really, uh, didn't, you know, we're a new country, obviously, yeah. so we didn't have those whole institutions linked to medical <coughs> research, I think. But that's an alarming bit, actually. I mean, really, when you think about countries where medical, the medical profession relies on academic research and continues to progress and develop, with the private sector taking over, I don't think medical research is very high on their priority because that's probably a, a some cost to or some sort of thing. So I think you leave us with a bit of a fear of what, what, what to expect in our old age, which is coming very soon, I think, for me at least. <laughs> to be trying. Uh, please, I would like to invite uh, questions from the floor. Any questions, any thoughts? Mr. Adam here can answer and address anything from leadership to whatever you can think of in governance. Please. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Fahad. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, my voice is loud. Um, I used to live in New Zealand for about five and a half years. So. And uh, one thing you know, about the PPP that happened in New Zealand, that everything is like given to the private, but for example, uh, garbage uh, collection and uh, cleaning to rooms and you know, like most of the stuff. And that we hated because you know, we leave stuff outside and we, you know, the company, oh, this is not allowed to come put it outside or even for the inorganic collection at the end of the year or whatever. So, I mean, not all this stuff the government does, you know, give to the private sector is um, actually, you know, they don't ask the public whether this is nice or not, but um, <coughs> this is going even 
further now because I was listening to a professor from Georgetown and he's saying that not only that, that we should go for public-private partnership and everything, we have to go deeper into the community itself. So for example, let's take Dubai and we break Dubai into Satwa, uh, uh, Dubai, Bardera and wherever and they put like Bird Dubai will be a community and they have to run themselves, you know, like their own schooling, their own garbage collection, their own policies, their own rules, their own everything, roads and you know like and, and everyone is supporting that professor and saying, Yeah, why not? You know, like let's go to the minute details rather than just spreading, you know, and then that will actually that in his thinking is going to break it's going to break the, um, you know, like uh, someone pays somebody, an official government to pay the contract and, you know, it's going to be more focused and more um, like clear, you know, that everything is going exactly as per the rules. So I don't know how you think about that, the community enterprise model. That's what he was calling it. So, a couple of comments. Um, one in relation to um, garbage collection. Um, the in the state of Victoria where I live, um, um, the garbage collection has been delivered by the private sector uh, for 15 years now, and they over that time the service has probably improved. Uh, not not. Um, in terms of it's not collected any more regularly, I think it's probably collected less regularly, but um, they've instituted for very good reasons um, separation of rubbish into recyclable and, and as a result we are retrieving or reusing a lot of material that otherwise they obviously make money out of that because they sell them into re recyclers, recyclers. So it was a commercial interest there that local government when previously it was doing didn't see quite as clearly. Um, the other I mean the other question about how we organize um, best organize the provision of services within local government areas is one where uh, I think the research should be a really powerful influence over what is chosen and I suppose my my Questions would be, you know, how well informed is the community about the strengths and weaknesses of a particular model, and how how well grounded in research is the sort of summary that's available about strengths and weaknesses? Because, I mean, one of the great risks of trying something genuinely new is that you don't know what's going to happen, what the risks are, and as a human, as a human race, we have a a tendency to be very clear about what the benefits are going to be, and much less focused on what the risks are. Uh, so, um, I hope that uh, someone somewhere has has identified the risks and the opportunities, um, and that that almost certainly we will find that radical change will evolve. And what you will find is in operation five or ten minutes, five or ten years after, initial initial change will be quite different from what it was, um, and that will reflect better knowledge um, and better, more, more informed input from citizens about what they're prepared to pay for or what they're prepared to support. Um, but it is it is a great great drawback here. Available research is not widely shared, and people don't understand that there's been a, a rational, evidence-based um, decision-making process in embracing substantial change that affects their daily life. Thank you. Anyways, uh, I think community enterprise model will not work with us because I don't think you can have 200 nationalities agreeing on a certain way in, <laughs> in living in a certain area. So we're safe. Right. To, uh, okay to see if anybody else has any questions to Mr. Peter Allen. I will ask once, I'll ask twice. 
<laughs> this is uh, the best I can do, I guess. So, well, thank you, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate this, and we hope to see you again on the on other events very soon. You will receive uh, notifications of future uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, series. Uh, participants with us and I think there will be a wide range of topics and uh, some of our speakers will be very well published authors and writers in their own right and things so we will ensure that you are of course informed of this. I would like to also welcome our students who are with us this year. You're more than happy to see you participate with us. Hopefully we would like to uh, invite you to all the events and even to invite you to run your own events with us as well. So it was very nice seeing you all here today. We hope to see you again very soon. And I want to thank Mr. Peter Allen, who made a much appreciated effort at diverting his journey to Italy by passing by Dubai. I'm sure he does not regret this. You know? You're all my witness. Huh? He doesn't regret this. So I can't be blamed ever for having uh, you know, made him do things he shouldn't have done or anything. So. We were very happy to see you today, Peter. Thank you very much. You gave us a very interesting day. Uh, we enjoyed getting to know our sister organization, I would say, and so The thoughts we have and the thoughts we share, I think our students will very much benefit from this. So much in common, so much in common. We have not seen any other entity so far which has, which, with which we have so much in common. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of you and other and of people who are all very welcome to this platform to come and to see us. And I would ask and encourage all of you here to uh, please give us any recommendations or any uh, nominations for any people that you may know who you believe would enrich this scene or this theatre or this platform here. It's yours and we are trying to do what we can to enrich and to enhance the quality of uh, intelligence in our community here. And I hope we, we will do a good job of that. Thank you all very much and see you again soon.